um, I've been working in the ag sector for about 12 years. I'm, I'm a, you know, a newcomer. And finally, my mother says she's proud of me. <laughs> and she says, your grandfather would be proud of you too. And uh, he was a University of Wisconsin graduate, a Badger, and went back to his home state of New Jersey and was one of the first county extension agents in the state of New Jersey. And he passed away in 1970, and I was a little kid, and you know, he had his, these books, his bookshelf, and I was always impressed by, you know, of course, the biggest volume in his bookcase, and that was Equine Care. And, you know, he was working in the 1920s with farmers, and he probably had a lot to do with the management of their horse and mule teams back then. And it's amazing to me that that's, you know, just a couple, two, three generations back, and I think the concept there illustrates a important point I'm trying to make in my presentation today is, and that's that, you know, things change. And boy, do they. Uh, we probably are in a, an environment where things change m even much more fastly than they did when my grandfather was county agent. But um, so anyway, I'm making my family proud here, I guess. <laughs> I hope so. And. Uh, uh, I work for Farm Pilot Project Coordination. For those of you who don't know about Farm Pilot, that's a nonprofit that was formed by a congressional charter in 2001 to look at new, t to pilot on farms, new technologies and methods that would help capture the nutrients from the manure in animal production. So Farm Pilot has been working, um, they, they, I think they have 40 some projects across the country over that period. And I'm fairly new with Farm, Farm Pilot. I've been working with them now for about a year and a half. And I'm working on a project in the Chesapeake Bay region. And the question we're trying to address and you know, we think uh, we can help with is, can manure to energy technologies help save the Chesapeake Bay? All right, so you know we're here in Denver, so um, I'm working in the Chesapeake Bay region, so I thought I'd give you a little bit of background on the Bay Area. The Chesapeake Bay is located in the Mid-Atlantic. Um, it is the third largest estuary in the world. It is 200 miles long and 30 miles across at its widest point. And what makes this a particularly productive estuary is the nearly 12,000 miles of shoreline. It is a highly bisected shoreline. So there's a lot of interface there for a lot of productivity. It has the largest land area to water volume of any estuary in the U.S. So it has a big watershed, a 64,000 square mile watershed, which includes parts of six states. New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia, a little bit of Delaware, and a little bit of West Virginia. And 17 million people live in the watershed. Okay, and as most of you know, or as all of you know, um, estuaries are some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. The bay is home to 36,000 species of plants and animals, and it is a, considered a national treasure. Much like the talk this morning with Rocky Mountain National Park, you know, we've got our Chesapeake Bay. Um, and however, it is impaired with nutrient and sediment loads, and there's a concerted, the concerted effort for bay cleanup. And as you know, um, nutrients and sediment loads come from all across the landscape. I'm going to be looking at the uh, loading from agriculture. And as we talk about, uh, especially the nutrient loading, nitrogen and phosphorus, um, the burden on the bay from animal agriculture is pretty significant. I mean, you don't, it's not unsurprising either because that is certainly the biggest land use in the bay. But um, for nitrogen and phosphorus both, about 45, 45% 40, uh, of the load is coming from agriculture. In nitrogen, about a third of that animal ag load is coming from um, the animal manures, and in phosphorus, fully 80% of the ag burden on the bay is coming from animal manures. So our real focus with the project I'm working on is to address that phosphorus loading. So we're looking at um, new management tools for manure 
against a backdrop of the importance of agriculture in the Bay Region, and this is probably true everywhere across the country, but agriculture has a big economic impact in the Bay Region, and it is the number one industry in New York, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. It's number two in West Virginia after coal, and it's in the top five in Delaware. And the map that you see on your right is, um, shows the value of livestock and poultry as part their percentage of the market value of ag production in the Bay Region. And when you get in into the orange and the red uh, units there, you're looking at 65%, 85% or greater of your market ag value is coming from animal production. So animal production is important in the Bay Region and uh, combined agricultural value of products in the Bay is over 17, about 16 and a half billion. So the question our uh, team is working on is um, are there new tools to reduce the delivery of the, to the Bay of the animal manure nutrients? And the initiative has come about to assess emerging technologies that are promising alternatives in manure management. We have funding through the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, USDA, NRCS, EPA, and then the Chesapeake Bay Funders Network, which is really a group of philanthropic uh, uh, nonprofits that uh, have a variety of missions, but they are funding, uh, they fund the Bay cleanup as well. There are a number of par project partners, and someone this morning said, um, I guess it was on this panel that, um, you know, they brought these committees together and it was really challenging to work with the committee. We have a committee that is our steering committee that represents um, the Bay Funders, uh, Sustainable Chesapeake, uh, led by Christian Hughes Evans, is really the um, lead PI. The, she's managing all of the components of this project. Farm Pilot is in charge of installation of the technologies on the farms and monitoring their performance. Um, the University of Maryland Environmental Finance Center is taking a look at the project economics. We have several partners working on outreach and dissemination of income outcomes through e-extension. We'll be posting on the e-extension website. Um, Virginia Cooperative Extension and Virginia Tech are helping us with emissions testing as well as the evaluation of uh, the ASH co-products from these technologies that we're uh, testing out. And Lancaster County probably represents the one region in the Bay that probably has the biggest impact from animal agriculture. And um, the Soil and Water District there is a, a, quite a leader in that effort to clean up in Lancaster County. And they did a study of nutrient balance in the county probably five years ago. And they have dairy and swine and, and cattle. And they figured that to be in balance, and they have poultry too, quite a bit, to be in balance they'd have to ship all the poultry manure completely out of their watershed to, um, to really have any sort of nutrient, hope for nutrient balance. So we're looking at manure to energy technologies, and you know, manure to energy, man, you know, just, could that happen? And of course it can. Manure has energy, and if you remember your grade school history classes, the settlers traveled across this country and buffalo chips for their, as fuel for their fires. And manure was a source of, an important source of fuel for those settlers in the 1800s. So manure does have energy, wrong way. And there's a, a chart that gives you the uh, range of BTU values in, in various manures. And, and it compares them to the BTU values that you might find in coal or wood. And you know, it's surprising, you look at dairy manure and swine manure and think, wow, that's pretty high BTU range. But of course, you know, they're about 80% moisture, which creates a problem for using them as fuel. We're looking at using poultry litter. Um, that's got a lower BTU value, but the moisture content in poultry litter is about 20 to 28%. So can manure to energy succeed as a nutrient management tool? I mean, that's the critical question for us. And we know manure can produce renewable uh, energy. It's carbon neutral, which is great. 
we also want to know if these systems that we're looking at can provide an economic return for the farmer. I mean, he's not going to have any incentive to implement these technologies unless it affects his bottom line. And then the third leg of our stool is, will it enable the removal of nutrients uh, of, from our watershed? So our project is to demonstrate new technologies in the Bay watershed at the farm scale. Several of these systems you'll see are regional or uh, community scale. We're looking at on-farm scale systems that are technically feasible. And by technically feasible, I mean systems that are commercially available. We weren't interested in R&D and bench scale processes. We wanted things that were on the market that we could test drive. We, are produce, we were looking for systems that could produce heat and or electricity, that's great, and that would definitely provide a pathway to remove nutrients from the watershed. So we're test driving five systems on five different farms across the watershed. And as we went through this process, we were looking for technologies that dealt with animal manures. We looked at, oh, five minutes, man, uh, <laughs> you know, dairy and, uh, digestion and things like that, but we landed on poultry litter and thermochemical conversion systems because um, we knew that we could, at a high temperature range, either gasify or combust poultry litter and um, generate heat for poultry houses and produce an ash byproduct, which is about a 20% weight and volume of the raw litter. It's dry, it's manageable, it's high phosphorus, and we can move it out of the watershed. So very quickly, these, are, um, these show different thermochemical conversion processes and the temperature ranges at which they occur. And so you have at the low temperature range a conversion of manures through composting or anaerobic digestion. Pyrolysis is a different temperature range. The systems we're looking at are in the gasification and combustion ranges, higher temperature ranges that um, take the feedstock. You have emissions, you have heat, and then you have ash, heat and or electricity. So is, you know, an important piece of this is the um, ash a valuable co-product. We figure to make any of these things economically viable, we have to look at multiple revenue st streams. Just the energy alone is not going to support the installation of a system. But if you have ash that you could sell as a valuable m a nutrient that might um, improve your bottom line, the analysis of litter is about a 332. Some of our combustion systems are yielding a, a more, much more concentrated phosphorus and potassium analysis. And this is what they look like. Uh, a few different technologies represented here. The green system, the BHSL, is a fluidized bed combustion system. It's been developed developed in Ireland um, and is on um, several farms in the UK. The blue uh, boiler system um, on your right is a um, modified boiler. It uses, um, it, it, in both of these systems, provide hot water into hot water heat exchanges in the poultry houses and generate heat for the poultry houses. There are a couple of these um, blue flame systems now operating in Pennsylvania and they've uh, really garnered a lot of interest up in that region. We have um, to, on the left uh, a gasifier. These are both gasifiers. The two previous were combustion systems. These are actual gasifiers. The one on the left is in South Carolina. It is the only grid connected electrical generating poultry litter to energy system in the U.S. It's not optimized yet and fully performing. That happens to be a farm pilot project, uh, project and is um, something that we'll be working on this summer to see if we can gain full performance on that system. And if any of you were out looking at the manure uh, manager booth, they have um, these magazines, and it's the cover story. So if you're interested in that system, it, it's um, that cover story. The gasifier on the right is one we'll be putting in on a, a farm in um, Lancaster County. And we finally, getting through air quality permitting and locality permitting has been very challenging. We finally have a un one of our units in place, yay, in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. This is it being loaded. 
on, it's the simplest of all our systems. Um, what I've shown you uh, produce hydronic heat. This is actually a forced air system. It's really simple. It ducts 150 degree air into the center of the house at 8,000 cubic feet per minute and it, um, and it uses the house's stir fans and ventilation fans to distribute that heat down both ends of the houses. Uh, it's been running now for three weeks. The farmer is really very enthusiastic, which is, a, I think, a good testament to um, this system. We've, you know, encountered lots of um, questions about these systems. Will they work? Oh, that heating distribution system isn't going to be effective. And so we're hoping that at the end of this project, we'll, we'll know these systems a lot better. Um, we've encountered regulatory agencies that are really uncertain about these new technologies. We've had a significant discussion with EPA over whether manure is a fuel or a waste, and that will really um, impact how air quality permits are obtained for these systems. Um, farmers, EPA has worked with us to the extent that we are allowing, they are allowing the farmers to self-determine fuel legitimacy for these first systems. We need better emissions data so we can, you know, promote this kind of technology forward with some of these regulatory agencies. Um, and, and interestingly, we found real interest from the farmers who, in, in the whole Bay Region, we met with several and they are very interested in supporting new concepts for manure management um, and they're excited that these systems might be an additional source of revenue. So we have a lot to learn. Um, we'll be posting on the e-extension website and I think that uh, what we're doing hopefully will uh, bring forward some new technologies. These are not your father's Buick, they're not my grandfather's Edsel, we're more at the Model T stage of development but you know we'll get there. Thank you. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it known where that 3% N is going um, in the process? What's happening with the nitrogen? The nitrogen, we, we'll see some in the emissions. Most of it's coming off as um, the dinitrogen gas. We, you know, there's these, at these higher, at the temperature range we're combusting, um, as I understand it, because I'm not the technical person, is that the NOx is converted and you don't have a lot of NOx and greenhouse gas kinds of emissions coming out of the system. <coughs> But we, our emissions testing will inform that as we move forward. Now, are they doing a pre-drying test? No, no. There's, these are systems that can handle manure as is, just dumped in a hopper. And these um, technologies that have developed started at land-grant universities probably about 10 years ago. And they've been taken forward through more of a commercialization process. So they're pretty robust, and they do demonstrate that you can run manure and that was one of the criteria for selection they had we had people say oh we can burn it but they'd never burned manure and I think manure as you all know material handling is like a key piece of dealing with any of these waste streams mm -hmm. you're, you're forcing 153 air through the poultry house and then dispersing <laughs> yeah. what are you going to do in the summertime okay Well, you know, we're working with the farmer, and he thinks that will work. I mean, when he just needs a little bit of heat, we won't, I mean, and it might be that it might not work for the summer because you sort of have to heat these things up and they run, you know, more continually than an automatic start-stop kind of heat. So we don't know. Um, the rule of thumb is one chicken. The manure from one chicken will heat three chickens. So we have excess manure in the system. These don't co totally consume the farm's output, and the real goal would be able to have combined heat and power and flip a switch. So you divert that? To, yeah, and make heat when you need it or make it electrical energy on, on the other end. We're not quite there. One more question? Yeah, Jennifer. Um, you mentioned that the These are so new, we are asking the producers to partner with us and work in helping us get these on their farms. But for the equipment purchases, we're seeing great, um, we're seeing significant cost share coming from the vendors because they're interested in getting their systems out and tested as well. So we're benefiting them as well. Um, 
in Pennsylvania, uh, the EQIP program actually has contributed to that system. At for nutrient removal, that's, that's the reason for the payment. I think we'll have to stop there with the questions to shape the interest. Uh, please help me thank Jane for the presentation. Thank you. I'll give you